Welcome to my channel. Today, we are going to look at a story that took place in 2004 in New Jersey, USA. Brittany Gregory was born on April 1, 1988 in Brick Township and was the youngest of five children in her family. As a result of her parents' divorce, she was left to live with her father, but maintained a close relationship with all of her siblings, especially her sister Brianna, who was four years older than her. In school, Brittany proved to be an excellent student, and teachers assumed she could become a scholar. Her unusual dream, however, was to become a forensic scientist and study crime scene evidence. Brittany relished her role as the baby of the family, her mother said. She was spoiled, to be sure, but not vain or arrogant. She celebrated her 16th birthday in April by holding her mother to a promise she had made to let her get her belly button pierced. She idolized pop queen Britney Spears and had posters of her tacked up in her bedroom. She enjoyed cartoons, especially SpongeBob SquarePants, and she couldn't get enough of the TV shows about forensic science, a profession she wanted to pursue. She and her mother used to tune in to the same shows and then call each other to talk about them as they watched. In 2004, 16-year-old Brittany and her older sister Brianna, who was 20, lived with their father, Joe Dunn, and his new girlfriend, Lori Peterson, in a small house near their school. Brittany's father's house was the last one on the street and was near a wooded area. At the time, Brittany had been dating 18-year-old John Fitzgerald for almost two years. He was a nice guy that Brittany's family approved of. They had a very warm relationship and they were considered the perfect couple. On Sunday, July 11, 2004, Brittany's mother, Deborah, and her sister, Brianna, drove to the town of South Toms River, about 15 miles from Brittany's home, to visit her older brother and his wife, who had recently had a daughter. At about 8.30 p.m. that evening, Brittany called her mother on her cell phone and asked for a ride to her boyfriend, John's house. The girl's voice was very upset, indicating possible trouble. Her mother explained that she was out of town and couldn't drive Brittany, but said that her sister Brianna could be there in about an hour. Brittany agreed and said she would wait for her. About 45 minutes after Brittany called, Brianna was free and decided to call her, but her sister didn't answer. Brianna thought that Brittany was asleep or that someone else had taken her to John's. When Brianna returned home in the morning, she found that Brittany wasn't there but her things, including her phone, were still there. Brianna speculated that maybe Brittany had spent the night at her boyfriend's house, but it was strange that she hadn't told anyone about it and that she had left her cell phone at home. It wasn't like her. Looking for answers, Brianna started calling all of Brittany's friends to see if anyone had seen her, but no one knew anything. After trying unsuccessfully to contact her sister, Brianna decided to call John. He said he last spoke to Brittany on the phone Sunday morning, and they hadn't seen or spoken to each other since. Brittany's father's friend, Lori Peterson, who lived with them, said she returned home around 10 p.m. Sunday night, and Brittany wasn't there. Brianna sensed something was wrong, and immediately went to the police station to report Brittany missing. At first, the police did not take Brianna's concerns about her sister's disappearance seriously. It seemed to them that the girl had simply run away from home or was spending time with friends. But Brianna convinced the officers that she had already called all of her sister's friends and talked to her boyfriend. But none of them knew where Brittany might be. Brianna was sure her sister couldn't have run away from home because she was an honor student and spent most of her time in the library. Brittany never left the house without warning and all of her belongings, money and phone were left at home. After Brianna convinced the police that her sister could not have run away from home on her own, the officers began their search. First, they went to the house where Brittany lived to inspect her room and try to find some clues. They made sure that Brittany's purse with her phone, ID, and makeup was left in her room. The police did not find anything suspicious in her room. They interviewed everyone who lived in the house and ruled out the possibility that anyone close to Brittany was involved in her disappearance. The police then began a search of the area around the house. They checked all the houses in the area, walked around the property, and talked to neighbors. They looked for witnesses who might have seen or heard something. The officers noted that the house was at the end of the street and that there was a wooded area across the street. 
None of the neighbors noticed anything suspicious, except for one woman who said she saw Brittany walking down the street toward her house late Friday night when it was already dark. This was two days before Brittany's disappearance, and the information seemed insignificant, but investigators paid attention to it. This information did not fit the image of a modest girl who spent most of her time in the library and did not go out without her parents' permission. What made Brittany go out so late? And was she allowed to go out at such a time? The police were anxious to find out if Brittany was a real homegirl, as her sister had described her. Numerous police interviews with her family, neighbors, and teachers revealed that no one had anything bad to say about the girl. Everyone spoke very highly of her. While talking to the police, Brianna reported that Brittany and her boyfriend John had a strained relationship lately. The couple had been arguing a lot, and on the day of her disappearance, Brittany and John had another fight. This caused Brittany to be upset, and she wanted to visit John that evening to make up with him. The investigators decided to examine John's identity more closely. They invited him to the police station to see if he had seen Brittany the day she disappeared. John reported that his last phone call with Brittany was on Sunday morning. At that time, he was at the beach with friends, and Brittany was upset that he went there without her. They argued about it and have not spoken since. He also revealed that he broke up with Brittany a few days ago, but she couldn't accept it, even though she knew he was already dating another girl. John claimed that he had no plans to go out with Brittany that night and did not know she was coming to his house. The reason for their breakup was the rumor that Brittany had kissed another guy at the party, although John did not see it himself. Because of this, he decided to break up with her and started dating another girl. He last saw Brittany on July 10th, the day before she disappeared, when she gave him a letter expressing her desire to make up. The detectives asked John for permission to look at the letter Brittany had written, and he handed it to them. In the letter, Brittany apologized for her behavior and for breaking John's heart. She also asked him to remain friends. John seemed genuinely concerned and worried that Brittany hadn't been found yet. The police had no evidence linking John to Brittany's disappearance, and after he successfully passed a lie detector test, he was taken off the list of suspects. However, John did tell detectives one important detail. He said that Brittany often came to his house through the woods behind her father's house. The story of Brittany's disappearance became more and more complicated. Detectives began to wonder if Brittany had tried to get to John's house that night, which was about a mile from her father's house through the woods. It was already dark, and she could get lost or fall somewhere along the way. The police started a search in the woods that Brittany probably passed through. She may have walked along a path that started near her house. Being in the woods at night was scary and dangerous, and the question of why a young girl was not afraid to walk through the woods in the dark was puzzling. The search in the forest lasted for three days, but nothing was found. When it seemed that the investigation had reached a dead end, the police were contacted by a woman who had been with her brother in a park in the same area on the night that Brittany disappeared. It was quiet, deserted, and there were no cars but one. A Chevrolet pickup truck with distinctive wheels drove by. The woman noticed this car and even remembered its license plate. After a thorough check, investigators found that the car was registered to 23-year-old Anthony Geiger. To determine his connection to Brittany's disappearance, police Bagan investigating Anthony's past and found out that he was the ex-boyfriend of Bobby Joe, Brittany's sister. Bobby Joe told detectives that they broke up about a month ago because Anthony was overly jealous and paid too much attention to Brittany. She also said that she began to suspect that Anthony, who was 23 years old, had feelings for her younger sister Brittany, and finally decided to end the relationship with him completely. Brittany's friends remembered that Anthony always looked at her strangely and tried to flirt with her. The last time they met was at lunch, where Anthony tried to flirt with Brittany again. Detectives began to suspect Anthony of kidnapping Brittany and decided to bring him in for questioning. During the interrogation, Anthony denied being in the area where Brittany lived on the evening of July 11th. According to him, he was not there until the next day, July 12th, when the police had already started searching for the girl. He did not deny that he was on good terms with her and often saw her at parties and other places, but claimed that they were just friends 
and that he did not flirt with her. Anthony also stated that he understood that Brittany was too young for him and that he only cared for her as a friend. According to Anthony's testimony, he spent the evening of July 11th at home with his new girlfriend. Although this girlfriend confirmed Anthony's alibi, investigators still considered him a suspect because his house was close to where Brittany lived. Investigators went back to examine the letter Brittany had written to John and noticed disturbing signs that she was saying goodbye to her loved one. They began to fear that Brittany might be hurting herself after breaking off her relationship with her boyfriend. However, Brittany's parents rejected this version, believing that their daughter was smart and determined and would not give up her grand plans because of her breakup with her boyfriend. They believed Brittany was too in love with life. After the investigation again stalled, the police decided to reach out to the public through the media to find possible witnesses. In addition, police officers from other areas joined the investigation to assist. Brittany's parents also decided to take an active part in the search because they were tired of doing nothing and waiting. They decided it was time to take action and started going door to door and asking people in the neighborhood, but it didn't work. The police decided to go back to where it all started, to the house where Brittany lived. Even if she had decided to walk through the woods to meet her boyfriend, it was unclear why she had left her phone in her room. Could someone have kidnapped her right out of the house? If so, did she know that person? Did she trust him? During a thorough search of the house, the police found something important in Brittany's room, namely her personal diary, which contained a handwritten letter. The contents of this letter were of great importance to the police as it pierced the veil of secrecy surrounding family relationships. In the letter, Brittany described her life, her relationships with her friends and boyfriend, her schooling, and she also focused on her family. In particular, she wrote that she comes from a dysfunctional family, that every Sunday she visits her older brother who is in jail, that her mother is a drug addict, who left her when she was nine, and that she now has to live with her father, with whom she is not very close, and his girlfriends. She also wrote that she is not perfect and that she has had to do things she is not proud of. But she doesn't want to be like her parents and wants to succeed in life. She wants to be a forensic scientist and help solve crimes. After reading this letter, the police expanded the pool of suspects and turned their attention to Brittany's family who had not previously been considered as potential suspects. Detectives began checking on each member of Brittany's family and discovered that a male massage parlor was operating out of the house where she lived. Lori Peterson, a friend of Brittany's father, served different men every day, but all the neighbors knew that she did not give massages, but provided intimate services for money. It turned out that many people knew about it, and Lori herself did not hide it handing out her business cards around the area. Neighbors also reported that suspicious people often gathered at Brittany's father's house to use illegal substances. To the police, this indicated that the atmosphere in Brittany's home was dysfunctional. Various men, most of whom Lori did not know, came to use her services. It was possible that one of her clients had kidnapped Brittany from the house. More than a hundred police officers began working to identify everyone who had been in Joe Dunn's house in the past month. It was a very difficult task. But a week after Brittany went missing, on July 18th, police announced the arrest of a murder suspect. Brittany's family was shocked by the news, since she had been reported missing and her body had not been found. When a picture of the suspect was shown on television, Brittany's mother, Deborah, recognized him. It turned out to be her longtime friend, 38-year-old Jack Fuller Jr., who had attended all the family gatherings and had been close to them for 20 years. His daughter was engaged to Brittany's brother, who was in prison. Deborah was in shock. Why had Jack been arrested and charged with murder since Brittany's body had never been found? The family couldn't believe that Jack could have been involved in this case since his children were friends with Brittany. They still hoped Brittany was alive. Fuller, a hardened criminal, threatened the neighbors of his Howell home for most of his adult life. According to court records and interviews, he broke into cars, houses, and garden sheds, used and sold drugs, threatened a man with a baseball bat, 
fought with police and lied to them about his identity after being arrested for drunk driving. He has been arrested more than a dozen times in the last 10 years alone. He has served time in state prison for theft and parole violations. According to neighbors, many of his crimes went unreported because people were afraid of him. The last time he was tried, he was sentenced to five and a half years in prison and was released a year before Britney disappeared. Britney's parents assumed that Jack might steal money or jewelry to buy drugs, but they did not believe he could hurt their daughter. Shortly after Fuller's arrest, it became known how the police were able to link him to Britney's disappearance. It all began with a call received at the police station. The caller said that a few days earlier he had met Jack, who had complained to him of back pain that had developed after he had buried the girl's body in the sandy soil. Jack assured him that the place where he had hidden the body would never be found and asked how deep the body should be buried so that the animals would not smell it. The police invited the informant to the station and suggested that he wear a listening device to meet with Jack Fuller and question him about the crimes, including the murder. The informant agreed, and at the meeting, Fuller told him that he had buried the girl's body in a remote location and that he would never be found. Although he confessed to committing the murder, he never mentioned Brittany's name. In addition, Fuller stated that he needed to kill someone else who knew too much, pointing to his friend Tommy, who was in the car and did not hear these words. The detectives were sure that Tommy knew something important that could help solve the case, or Jack Fuller would not have wanted to get rid of him. They went to Tommy's house and took him to the station for questioning, but he refused to cooperate, saying he didn't know anything. The detectives knew that he was lying. To prove their point, they played a recorded conversation in which Jack says he wants to kill Tommy because he knows too much. Tommy realizes that he is in danger and decides to cooperate with the police. He tells them that the night Brittany disappeared, he and Jack were driving around the neighborhood smoking crack. They stopped in front of Brittany's house and Jack decided to go inside to talk to her father about some things. When he entered the house, there was no one there but Brittany. Five minutes later, Jack returned to the car with Brittany, and she sat in the back seat. According to Tommy, he was confused and asked what was going on. Brittany didn't answer anything. She lowered her gaze, and Jack said he was about to take Tommy home. Tommy claimed that Jack drove him home, and when he got out of the car, Brittany, who was sitting in the back, also got out of the car and got into the front passenger seat, and then he and Jack drove off. The next day, when they met again, Jack said nothing about what had happened the day before. They stopped at a car wash where Jack gave his car a good wash inside and out. This was unusual because he had never done it before. The car wash attendant even joked about it, but Jack got angry and told him to mind his own business or he would risk his life. Tommy explained that when he found out about Brittany's disappearance, he realized that Jack might be involved and asked him directly what he was doing with the girl. Jack became very angry at the question and said that he had taken her home and left, rudely asking him not to ask again if he didn't want trouble. Tommy assumed that Jack had taken Brittany to the woods to rape her because he had planned to use Lori's intimate services that night, but she wasn't home. The detectives realized that Jack was just the man for them. When they arrived to arrest him, Jack had a can of gasoline in his hands and looked like he was going to burn his car. Was he going to burn the car to destroy the evidence? Yes, it looked like he was. During the search, blood was found in the car, and forensics determined that it was Brittany's blood. After the police found out that Jack had visited a car wash after a trip with Brittany, they went there and confiscated the vacuum cleaner he was using. Criminologists found particles of sand stuck together by blood inside the vacuum cleaner. Testing left no doubt that it was Brittany's blood, Despite the evidence available to the police, Jack would not confess to the kidnapping and murder of Brittany and refused to talk about it. Detectives interviewed all of Jack's acquaintances, and most of them were sure that he was capable of murder. Many described him as a man ready for anything. Despite the fact that Jack didn't work anywhere, he always had money. During the investigation, it turned out that on the night of Brittany's disappearance, one of the patrol officers saw a car parked on the side of the road near the woods. It was Jack Fuller's car. At the time, it was not known that Brittany had disappeared. 
When the officer approached Jack, he said he was looking for his dog, which had run off into the woods. Given this information, the search for the body focused on the area where the officer saw Jack's car. Police officers, K-9 units, helicopters, and volunteers participated in the search, but it was unsuccessful. Investigators speculated that Brittany was desperate for someone to drive her to her boyfriend's house that night. When Jack showed up at her house, she asked him to do it. Jack agreed to take her wherever she needed to go, but instead he took his friend Tommy home and decided to take advantage of the situation by raping and killing Brittany. But to prove it, her body had to be found. While the police were trying to interrogate Jack and get a confession, another witness came forward. A woman called the police and said that if Jack Fuller really did kill Brittany, she might know where he hid her body. This woman was a former drug addict, and Jack once held her hostage for months before she escaped. During that time, she had gotten to know Jack well and knew all his secrets, where he went and what he did. He often went to the same places and took her with him. One day he showed her a place near a power line and told her it was a great place to bury her and that no one would ever find a body there. The detectives did not believe the woman at first and began asking her questions. She reported that the site was in Lakewood and that the soil was sandy. The police immediately remembered the words of an informant who told them how Jack had complained to him about the difficulty of burying a body in the sandy soil. The authorities decided to conduct a search in the area the woman had pointed out. It was only three miles from the house where Brittany lived. After several days of searching, there were no results, but the police kept searching because experts compared the sand from the vacuum cleaner used by Fuller at the car wash to the soil in the area and got a perfect match. More than 100 people a day combed the dense forest on the border of Monmouth and Ocean counties. Brittany's grave was finally discovered on Tuesday morning, July 27, 2004, 15 days after she was reported missing. She was found by three New Jersey K-9 officers who had brought their dogs on a weekend search to help. The young girl's naked body turned up in a hole, and a necklace with Brittany's name on it hung around her neck. The detectives knew immediately that they had finally found her. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy confirmed that it was Brittany Gregory's body, but he was never able to determine the exact cause of her death because the girl had been strangled and suffered head trauma. I'm not going to deny that there was trauma to her head, but that was not the cause of death, said Ocean County Executive Assistant Prosecutor Robert Gasser. The body had decomposed over two weeks, and the medical examiner has said he can't rule out strangulation or suffocation. Gasser said. Brittany's body showed no obvious signs of sexual assault, but the medical examiner did not rule out the possibility of rape. Jack Fuller decided to take a plea bargain after consulting with his attorney. Brittany's family also agreed to the deal to avoid a long and arduous trial. Brittany's mother stated that she did not want the death penalty for Jack because it would be too easy for him. She wanted him to spend the rest of his life in prison, suffering and regretting what he had done. Jack said Brittany asked him to take her to her boyfriend's house, and he agreed. First he took Tommy home, and then he was going to take Brittany to her boyfriend. But before that, he stopped on the side of the road and started smoking crack. This caused Brittany's anger, and she started yelling at him and slapped him on the arm. This pissed him off, and he started punching Brittany. He admitted to punching her in the face and head at least twice because she tried to stop him from smoking crack. After the beating, Brittany began to make gasping and gurgling noises. Fuller continued to get high as blood flowed from her nose and mouth. When he finally turned his attention to her, Brittany stopped breathing. He realized she was dead and decided to dispose of the body. However, his story was not believed because the medical examiner found evidence of strangulation on Brittany's body that Fuller did not mention. In addition, he did not explain why he had taken off all of Brittany's clothes. The prosecution believed that the crime was sexually motivated. An Ocean County grand jury indicted Fuller for murder on February 9, 2005. Fuller later pleaded guilty on October 18, 2005 to purposely and knowingly causing serious bodily injury resulting in death. 
He was sentenced to 30 years without parole on January 13, 2006.